Um, good. Before I go to the slideshow, just uh, thank you, uh, Professor Golubov. I, I would say I'm, I've certainly been part of the process that's trying to broaden the range of histories in, in, in local history, but that comes, you know, with the momentum of a group. Um, uh, certainly, Professor Golubov's been doing that, and, and I think an interesting thing is the different skill sets that people bring. Um, you got an anthropologist and a creative writer on on one side. We've got the archivists at special collections, and to the extent that those uh, are accessible to you guys or you can connect with them, it really is a, a rich resource. Um, at a lot of universities, it can be harder to kind of get in the vault. Um, and the staff here are extraordinary, um, and they're also all, all locals. Um, they're all natives, and to the extent that you're doing local history projects here, it's just worth thinking about that as its own kind of skill set, own way of thinking through questions of no networks. Uh, I didn't grow up here. I've lived here twice, so I'm not quite in this born here, come here thing that seems to define uh, Rockbridge. Um, in my uh, first stint in Lexington, I, I taught in the English department, and, and Sasha said I, I taught Shakespeare, taught Shakespeare women's studies, cultural studies. So the focus today on poetry, um, which is, is part of that, um, is informed in part by a set of training and a set of interests about how do people try to communicate certain things when they make a decision to uh, perform, to articulate within a certain genre, right? A sermon, a poem, uh, a stump speech. Uh, I'm not really going to be talking today about the aesthetics. Um, you know, why does she write in couplets? Why did we'll talk a little bit about dialect? Uh, why would you do that, or, or, or uh, genre and, and religion? Um, so I guess what I'd say, I'm interested in the types of writing that Eliza Walker does. I'm interested in the types of self-presentation, what I might call self-fashioning was an important term in literary studies. How do you fashion yourself? How do you present yourself? How do you make yourself um, in a moment that is not only important for her, but really I would, I would say there, there is a certain kind of racial self-fashioning, the phrase, the rise of the new Negro in this period, post-reconstruction, that first generation of educational economic opportunity after emancipation and re reconstruction. I, I see Eliza Walker as a kind of avatar for that. Um, she's a representative figure in a lot of ways, and one who, like many women of her era and, and of other eras, uh, has been in the shadow of some others, um, I think notably her husband. Uh, her husband, Harry Lee Walker, the business owner, has been the kind of anchor uh, in defining certain very important narratives in Lexington history. Uh, but I'll tell you, the variety of things she has her finger in <laughs> is extraordinary, and it keeps unfolding. And I hope that if you all find some points of interest here, um, I was telling Professor Golubov, there are a couple small little threads that maybe y'all might be interested in, could help me find out some things. Some of you, I believe, are working on the Wilson Walker house. Is that correct? Um, can someone raise a hand if that's you? Um, there, we call it the, the Walker Woods Meat Market. So Okay, so Walker Woods Meat Market. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's known in part for Walker, and is that Harry Lee Walker or his wife Eliza Walker or both? Um, the Walker program, the economic incentive program we have today was deliberately named for both. Um, so I think that Eliza has a lot to say. Uh, I'm hoping that her story will make its way into things like the Encyclopedia of Virginia, will make its way into places like the Virginia Museum of History and Culture to broaden that. Um, not simply to say, well, it's lesser known or, or not seen, but to say because it's representative. Um, and I, I think there's there's a lot to, to hang on here. So um, thanks for welcoming me. The last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is I'm very excited to see what you all shape, um, quite, quite literally, how you see the town and how you show it. I'm not going to be able to join in on the day you present. Uh, but I'll look forward um, uh, to seeing that. And somewhere down the line, probably not in the Q&A here, 
Um, but in follow up, if any of you are interested in museums, in public history, sort of documentary work, public humanities, I'd be happy to talk with you about it. Um, it's a career that I found my way into kind of through a side door. And I think a lot of people did. And there's a lot of work there with business and marketing. And it's not just curatorial work or executive leadership, uh, education. Um, there's more there than I thought. Um, and there's a lot of people at this university right now that are working very creatively to think about how to interpret the university's history and community histories. So if you get interested in that, um, I'll have my email at the end of the show um, and uh, I'm, I'm findable, it's a small town. Uh, and I'd love to have you guys, any of you who are interested as conditions permit to our museum, and walking tours around town and such. Okay, let's uh, cross our fingers for a screen share here. Um, looks like we're good. We see in three pictures of, of Eliza. And I will say I'm going to call her Eliza generally. Um, I, I feel like I've gotten to know her in certain ways. Um, in many ways, I might call her Walker, but there are multiple Walkers in the story. I might call her Mrs. Walker. Uh, Bannister is her father's name. Uh, she, like many in her generation, is the child of the first men who voted in Lexington, first black men who voted in Lexington in 1867. Uh, and I think bearing that legacy is, is, in, is important. You see in, in the opening, I'm giving multiple pictures of her here. Uh, I, I talked about self-fashioning. I'm assuming, you know, she staged these three photographs. She was responsible for them. I don't have dates on them. This one is about you know, 1918, 1920. Um, this seems to be a little bit earlier. This is one that shows up, she tends to use in some kind of professional settings, like in talks. Um, I've often seen her titled here, President uh, Eliza Walker, right? Signaling her title. Um, whereas we'll often see Mrs. H.L. Walker here, Mrs. Harry Lee Walker, President. Um, this is an era where more women start using their middle initials. You can think Susan B. Anthony. Um, uh, and I, I think that's a way of, of you know, signaling a, a certain presence. We've just found another woman named um, Coralie Franklin Cook, who was born enslaved in Lexington. It's Coralie Franklin, a descendant of one of the Hemings family at Monticello, and goes on to be a colleague with Susan B. Anthony and W.E.B. Du Bois in Washington, D.C., one of the leading figures for black women's suffrage, um, and in some ways kind of breaks with Susan B. Anthony and the, the white mainstream women's suffrage group uh, because it's not pushing far enough after the 19th Amendment. Walker will play her own role in politics um, here, both locally and nationally. Uh, she's contemporary. Um, with that, um, but I want you to see that she's got this sort of more, I don't know, artsy look. I used to think this was kind of her, because she's a singer, you know, like her singer's head shot. Um, this is her shot, like, I mean business. <laughs> you know, I'm going to I look at those eyes like she's getting done whatever she needs to get done. Uh, and here she is just with these three orphaned young girls um, looking straight into our eyes. I mean, I She's not looking into my soul here. She's not looking into my soul here. She is here, as are, are these, these children, these young girls, young women, um, in a very direct humanitarian appeal. And we'll talk about what's going on in this image, um, but at some slightly different ages, you know, she's, she would have been, she was born in 1872, so she's in her mid forties here. Um, presenting herself to different audiences at different points in life. Um, and she's just very savvy. I lead with social networks because while I, I think she's fine as a poet, you know, I don't think she's a brilliant craftswoman as a poet. I think she's very savvy and thoughtful in how to use that poetry in social networks and who to use it with and how to signal. Um, and she can talk with local leaders, 
national leaders, the state. I mean, I, I think you all know these people. Some of you are these people who you have whatever skill sets you have, but they're, they're people who just connect people and get things done. Um, and it's hard to describe that sometimes, but we see the evidence with her. And it's a moment when women in the public stage have new capacities to do that in the way that they didn't in the 1860s, or very limited. Um, so she's really taking this work into the public sphere and also both within the black communities and with white communities um, and to a certain degree of bridging. So hello, Eliza Bannister Walker. Um, here's another picture. I recently identified her in this. I, I, this picture is in our uh, county history. I've looked at it a lot. I love this image of the singing group, the Charity Nightingales. Um, so they're not just singing nightingales like um, you know, John Keats' poem, but uh, they're doing it for charity, right? There's a civic purpose. Uh, this is her. You can line up her face, her glasses. Uh, many of us wear glasses, but sometimes she, she has a more sort of studious look. Um, very well put together group across different ages, right? Some younger voices, uh, some more senior voices. Um, and they sing for many different settings in this town, uh, certainly well known. So back to that earlier picture, I, I ask, what do you see here? Um, who do you see here? And I know this is likely very small on your screen. I will share with you the slideshow because some of the really important stuff is to see that Wright's Orchestra in Columbus, Ohio is a sponsor, okay? And this is actually, this would be a good little puzzle out thing. Somebody likes research. If you're from Ohio, like, can someone help me figure out who is Wright's orchestra? <laughs> I'll figure out how she knew them. Howard Dental College. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to that. Here's that photograph, and you can see drawn by hand, Violet and Virginia, and then Annie. You know, these were the girls who had disabilities, various physical disabilities, speech disabilities, right? And Walker uh, is taking them in. We believe this is the porch of either a farmhouse or, or a building she had built on the Walker family farm, one of the farms that was bought in 1901. Um, it extend, it's, it's out what we would call on East uh, Nelson Street, Route 60, kind of where Arby's, um, Sheet, CVS over on the other side, BB&T. Um, at a certain point, the road that went through split their farm, and they actually started selling parts of it off. Um, but if you know where Kentucky Fried Chicken is, you may or may not know that is Walker Street, um, and that is named for, I believe, for Harry Lee Walker. I don't think it was named for the Walkers or Eliza, though I'd like to think she earned it too. But that's, you know, a signal, and I don't know how many streets were named for black Lexingtonians in Lexington, not many, uh, but that's one and one that should be noted for why it's there. And again, we think this is probably that um, farmhouse. I think you all have seen their big home, Blandome. Is that right, um, Sasha? You know, the, the, Right, the one that's the top of Henry Street. The, the one. Yeah, that's a showpiece house. It's a trophy house. So they buy this farm in 1901. Uh, you make enough money slaughtering your hogs and curing your hams, you can buy Walker Woods. How, well, you buy the Wilson house and you name it Walker Woods house as your business. Um, you make that money. And then in 1917, you buy Blandome and you're literally looking over the town, right? The, the, the top of the black neighborhood, but also one of the, the great homes of town. So within two decades, really, Two and a half decades, um, Harry Lee Walker makes quite a business for himself because he is good at social networking and getting contracts with VMI and Washington College, Washington Lee fraternities. But she's doing her own thing. Um, and here, uh, written on the back of this, this was written by her daughter, Nanny, Nanny Walker, mother and people she took in and cared for from the poorhouse. 
Okay, so a poor house is what it sounds like. It's a pauper's house. That is out kind of northwest of town, a little north of uh, the Waffle House. You can see it on, on maps. Uh, Dr. Rainville is doing a lot of research on poor houses. Uh, interestingly, Walker will make much of the fact that the orphanage and old folks home she wants to build is not a state institution. It's very clear there's something about state institutions that um, is problematic and that her initiative uh, is going to offer something um, different. They ran away from the farm where the poor were kept. Wow. <laughs> um, and she took them in. And from there, we go to this. Um, it's such a fascinating image. This was published in uh, the Washington Eagles, a black newspaper in Washington, DC in 1920. Walker had gone to DC early 1890s. We know she trained as a nurse in DC, right? This becomes a, a common, well, not common, a possible profession uh, for many women, white women and black women to find their way in larger cities and to have a kind of transportable skill set, right? You could move to different communities or you could come back. Her grandson says she uh, trained at the Freedmen's Hospital, uh, the nursing program, uh, which was Freedmen's Hospital became part of Howard University. Um, the nursing program there started, I believe, in 1894. Um, so it's possible that she trained at that hospital. It's not altogether clear. There are some things that Alex Wood is, is, is spot on about, some things that are kind of close and need some some checking, but we know she trained um, as a nurse, um, and he notes she got not just her skills, but her desire to help, you know, not just in a clinical setting, but what we would call as a public health setting, right? Um, geriatrics, um, uh, help, helping needy populations. And so it's not just that she comes back to Lexington and says, I want to do this in my hometown. She does. But she starts to get all these connections. And I really want to know how between 1890s, a woman in her early 20s, late teens, and still in 1920, is she activating and sustaining those social networks to market this? I mean, not just in a DC paper. That's one thing, right? I mean, you send in your money, you know, so I know you editor, you know, run the ads, but presumably, I mean, if you're putting your bona fides and saying, I know preachers in North Carolina, I know orchestras in Ohio, a cafeteria in Richmond, an Elks Club in Ohio, veterans groups, I forget, uh, Dr. Robert McGuire was, uh, I believe he was affiliated with Howard um, and he also ran a pharmacy in town, which was a really important pharmacy on like Ninth Street. Um, if you know the Shaw neighborhood in uh, DC is a really important uh, sort of prospering uh, black middle-class neighborhood in the early 20th century. Um, a lot of things, tickets to, I, I just found an ad that um, you could buy tickets at Dr. McGuire's pharmacy to see the Washington DC YMCA basketball team play, or I think it was the Philly basketball YMCA play the Washington Five. They called them the Washington Five. As a big, huge event, like all of Howard was gonna come for DC, all of Lincoln University was gonna come for Philly. And the kicker, you know who provided the music? The Duke Ellington Orchestra. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, she's really sustaining herself in this world while she's living here in Lexington on this farm and, and, and leading the charge for, you know, unemployment committees and all these things. She has the capacity to work on multiple levels. And well, and she hosts the state women's club convention at her home in the same year. I mean, she's, you all know multitaskers. Again, many of you can do this. Some of us can't, <laughs> um, but I'm so fascinated by all these people. 
And I hope by now you can kind of get the overall pitch. We're going to sell a brick. I mean, museums do this today. We're, we're moving toward a capital campaign. We want you to invest in our community history. We want you to invest in Black histories and women's histories, right? To tell broadly representative stories. Give us a thousand bucks. We'll put your name on a brick and we'll put it in the wall, right? Um, uh, there are lots of different ways of physically building institutions, of edifying them. But the biggest thing, I mean, if you can make it out, this is not a shadow, but a reality. And this, these are concrete bricks. This man who says all of us is holding brick and mortar, right? This is material stuff. They want to turn, we think, it's not clear, we think they want to turn this house, this building, into that orphanage and old folks' home. Uh, there are other buildings on the property. There's no evidence of purchasing other property in town to make it a dedicated space. Um, it should also note at the outset, there's no real evidence that it got done um, at scale, right? They're taking care of these three children. We know the Walkers adopted a child of their own shortly after the death of their son. They adopt a boy who is almost the same age uh, as their recently deceased son. Uh, and they adopt him from Washington, I believe, um, to give him a chance right, and to fill a void in their lives, surely. So what is she doing? Mrs. H.L. Walker, dressed to the nines, right? You know, he's in his work clothes. Here she is dropping her brick, you know, in her nice hat. Um, but that's her, right? This is not just like some lady and some working class man. This is Mrs. H.L. Walker, right? She's got her, her, her stamp on it. And how are you going to do that? Well, you can send um, it to Lexington Old Folks Home at 9th Street Northwest. I think that is the address of Dr. McGuire's pharmacy, but it's someone, it's someone she knows, right? So send, send it to my DC office, which looks credible, right? I mean, do you want to, do you want to send it to, you know, my Yahoo mail address or my institutional mail address? She knows how to play this. She's got the editor of the paper, Jay Finley, the editor of the Eagle, is not just publishing the ad. He's a sponsor. Right? He's got prime place. Okay. So, uh, and there is, where's Dixie Scott? I think he's up here, maybe. Dixie Scott of Lexington. Right. So he's a, he's a kind of noted figure around town. Spending a lot of time on this image because I think it's important. And then you know, in the middle, we do get a representative type of an older woman. I read her as older, anyhow, uh, and two children whose patches on their clothing would signify poverty, I think, would need, right? Um, barefoot children here or nearly, okay? So there's a reality to it. There's a schematic version, right? You can be a part of this. Um, and you can be a contributor for your church, right? If you don't want to contribute, get your church to do it. Get your fraternity, your lodge, right? Uh, uh, fraternal orders like Elks, the Odd Fellows. Some of you may be, be working with the Odd Fellows Hall, um, yourself, your family. Um, and again, here's a close up. Um, of that, um, I would just stress this was sent out during World War I, right? It was kind of a hard time to raise money, I would think. Um, but she, she thinks about it and she says, how am I going to make the case now that you can't say for the first time because U.S. colored troops fought in the Civil War, but it's, it's, it's in, in scale, a part of the national, if segregated army, we have I used to think she was sending this to black soldiers to get them to send part of their money home. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm wrong in that. I think what she's saying is the colored soldiers are appealing. Colored soldiers who are sacrificing for the nation and working for the advancement of the race want you to help do your part. 
right? So that she's using the occasion of this. She's building on military service in a call for public service. That, that's what I think. I'd, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. I'm, I'm not, not totally sure about that. Um, I haven't seen other things like that, though. I, um, usually the call to service is um, sacrifice less, eat less, and invest in the army or invest um, in you know, liberty bonds, not in local social needs. And it's important that she really personalizes the supporters, as we saw on the other page, right? She doesn't just say, we've got doctors and newspaper editors behind us. She puts, she says their names, right? We understand today. We've always understood why saying people's names matters. And she says their names here, right? In different terms than we may say today. Um, but, you know, Violet, Virginia, Annie, right? Let's put names to the faces. Uh, and that's, it's a different kind of empathy feel when those girls are looking us in the face too. Right? They're not, uh, I don't know how to put it. They're just not objects out there of pity. I, I, I think we're, you know, they're on our neighboring porch in a way. They're intimate. Hey, Eric, I yeah. have a question. Um, yeah. So it says here, to we're asking someone to educate little Violet. So can you talk, do you know a little bit about education policy at the time that the poor houses were when people couldn't pay you know, rent or whatever were sent there, and there was no obligation to educate them, the children. I, I believe that is right. I believe there are often, uh, I don't know, but let's say often, sometimes opportunities to do that. Uh, churches often had roles here too, charitable roles in doing that. Dr. Rainville would, would be a good person to do that. Um, and we'll get later and talk about how is, uh, how are black schools being funded between 1865 and 1965, really, 1954. Um, but I, I would I would say that that um, I mean to to say we need not just to clothe them and to feed them, but to educate them. It's a, it's a smart and true argument, right? It's an advancement argument. Um, uh, Professor Bell would be good on that too, because she does a, look, a lot of work on uh, asylums, where the argument to educate may be a little different than the argument to care. This is on one of those mailings. So here's our first glimpse of her poetry. Um, now the orphans speak, right? This is first person. So, um, you know, it doesn't say I violet, and we go to like, here is poor Virginia. So I don't know if it's one girl speaking for the next or a, a type, but I, I think again, Eliza's smart. First person witness has, has a certain kind of pull. Um, listen to my plea. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're using religious language. Um, We've got practical things here. And here we get to the, the practical stuff, right? Let us, let us tell you the vision. We have big goals, male and female, multiple buildings. We want it to be modern. Here's what I'm saying. It is not a state home and the town is signed off, which is true. There's a letter that basically says the mayor and the white city council, you know, the, the strong citizens of Lexington are behind this. Uh, and we've got a state corporation charter. I mean, we sort of got insurance, we're backing. What they don't end up with is enough funds to make it happen. Uh, but, the, but the vision is um, secure. More poetry. Um, there's a lot going on here. I, I, the, the poetry, let, let's start with that. Um, she publishes this and sells it at a quarter a piece. So if you don't want to buy a brick, you can spend a quarter and, and you get this sheet music, basically. I don't know what you do with it. You know, you just say, I've invested. I mean, you could take it home and sing. Um, you know, these sound kind of like spirituals. These are obviously religious songs. They're drawing on Old Testament traditions. Moses is obviously, emancipation is obviously 
particularly important for black post-emancipation churches. Um, she's a Baptist. Uh, she's a, at first Baptist. You don't want to die in the Egypt land, right? Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land, tell of Pharaoh, let my people go. I mean, this is what she's drawing on. But by the end, we get to Jesus in Galilee. And so there's that traditional religious arc of a Judeo-Christian tradition that is also a kind of, as I say, a, a sort of cultural national tradition, right, um, of um, a Black emancipation politics and religious politics. And, you know, the fact that there's a chorus is interesting to me. I mean, this is a woman who's part of a singing group. We're going to look at other poems that could be songs but don't have choruses. There's a vision in principle that this is a song that one could, I mean, the, the, the poem we just saw did not have a chorus, right? It was a first person song. There's some kind of move that says you purchase this, you buy into this, and you're, you're, part, of, you're part of a group. I, I think there's something to that. Okay. Um, and then overall, oh, and the last on the lyrics, I mean, it's hard to read these lyrics when you know she's selling them to help the needy and not say there was something, because she wrote these, right? She didn't like pick these out of an anthology. She had control over every word on this page. So to say, I want to lead the children I want to heal the sick, the lame did walk, the blind did see. I mean, we've just seen the faces of these people. The fact that her firstborn died, I mean, for a Passover narrative, whoa. I, uh, you have to be a little careful with biography and genre, uh, but I'm, I'm going to put that in play for sure. Where do you buy them? So it's composed by Mrs. H.L. Walker, and you buy them at her husband's store. Um, I think there's a claim to credibility here, right? You know, this isn't seat of your pants, right? This is a real legitimate operation. Um, some of these she will she will sort of sell on their stationery. I mean, she effectively is putting it on on a masthead, a letterhead. Okay, and, and that's in, in, important. Um, who, again, who is buying this? I'm not quite sure whether they're going to sing it, but I think you're buying it because you, you're aligned with a certain sense of religious charity, collective purpose, um, and uh, the commitment to cultural growth as well as to you know, personal care. So, here is, I think you've probably seen these photographs, you know, an earlier one. This is her husband, Harry Lee Walker, born in 1875, not born in Lexington, um, but trains as a butcher, uh, actually out in Rockbridge, Allen Springs. Um, counts, I think he walked out there or rode out there to do his work, courted his wife down in Natural Bridge, right? You had to have a certain mobility to get around, but this is him. Um, there, and there's your mobility. Later on over here, you can see him in his apron, uh, his son-in-law, I think this is his son, yeah, that's Clarence, and Clarence's brother, uh, I think it's Joseph. So a little later on, it becomes a family enterprise. So Woods, Harry Lee Walker's daughter, Nanny, marries Clarence Wood. Wood. Um, so that's how it, it becomes a family operation. Okay. Um, here again, another poem, same business model. And they're probably published in the same year. We don't, we don't have dates on these. Um, but Jesus is my captain. I'm going to follow Jesus. A lot of you have grown up in, in churches where you could probably set a tune to this like in your ear, right? The meter is very conventional. They're rhyming couplets. They're they're going to be easier to remember. There's, I wouldn't say anything especially original about the type of poem. And I'd say that's a choice. We're going to see some original poems. 
I think she's writing in conventions. I think she's wants an audience that says, yeah, I can recognize that genre. I, I like sort of spirituals, gospel. Um, I don't need T.S. Eliot, right? You know, Wasteland, not so much. I don't need Stravinsky, Rite of Spring. Like I want something in the early 19 teens, 20s that is familiar to me that I can invest in. Here we are at the Nightingales again. Um, you have to zoom in on this. In the 19, we think it's the 30s. They sing at Lexington High School, okay, which at the time is now what is Waddell Elementary School. In 1927, the city finally builds a high school for black students, Lilburn Downing School, and a high school for white students, uh, a new high school. It used to be City Hall. Okay, uh, but that's the big auditorium, and for the Nightingales to go sing there, according to this, is a big deal. I'm sure it's not the first time, but like this is the stage. And why do we know it's a big deal? Because lots of big, important white people went there to see it, who were music lovers, right? Many lovers greeted them, judging them, which of course becomes the art. How do we know if they're good? if that audience judges them to be good. And I wanna note a couple things down here I think are a little easy to miss. Um, I mean, it's not easy to miss. They sang to an audience of white people. I mean, why would you say white people rather than just saying they sang to a big audience? Because you wanna note that they are black and uh, arguably not many black people in the audience. Um, but down here, the audience was of goodly proportions and a representative one. I think you could read that a couple different ways. Um, one, I do think that there would have been black people in this audience, um, but members of the church, members of the, the committee, family members. So goodly proportions could have something to do with a ra racial breakdown. Goodly proportions could be just overall size, like did we fill the auditorium? I don't think that's the phrase you would use though for proportions. Um, I think it has to do, I think it's signaling that there is a mixed race audience and representative one does not mean like percentage of black and white in town. Representative one in this context means, um, are you respectable, are, are they respectable black people? And the word respectable, I wanna make clear here, carries a certain specific meaning in this period. Evelyn Higginbotham, a legal historian at Harvard, Harvard, has written a great book about the politics of respectability. And when you see people say he is a representative man, and it's, it's usually more about men or a respectable woman, um, it's sort of not just about virtue, but um, are you the, the kind of standard for your community. Uh, W.B. Du Bois talks about the talented 10th, uh, famously. The new Negro becomes a, a phrase that is used in the 1890s. Elaine Locke uses, Alan Locke uses it in um, the 1920s. Um, and so again, I wanna see her, she is the manager of them, but she's clearly part of a group. I mean, she's not standing to the side like I'm the boss. And she's part of a group, but she's a key figure. You can see that all their songs here are their sacred religious songs, right? They're not doing ragtime. They're not um, doing jazz. They may be capable of that. They do humorous recitations. Um, okay, William Doc of Doc's Tea Room is part of, part of the group, right? So um, it's, a, I think, an interesting and important group to, um, to look at. Um, here, 1907, so this is earlier, at First Baptist, this is a completely fascinating um, thing to me. Japheth and his daughter, Old Testament story about kind of a, I, I can't totally follow it, but a, it's a, you know, another king who's happy to like let his daughter's chastity be the price of you know holding on to his kingdom. Like she'll die, but we'll 
hold on to power. I, I may be off on that, but it's sort of the tragic story. A three-act cantata. Cantata is like an opera. Starts at 8.45 at night. Like, this is a long deal at First Baptist. And it's on what we would call Memorial Day weekend, Decoration Day. Decoration Day is about the United States. Confederate Memorial Day is a week later, June 3rd. That's Jefferson Davis's birthday. That's when Lexington celebrates Memorial Day. Um, the new courthouse was, was uh, dedicated in 1897 on June 3rd. So the fact that you have Decoration Day ceremonies where, yes, the post office is closed, but we're going to go to the, the cemetery of the colored people to decorate those graves. And the fundraiser is raising money for that mixed race audience. Um, you can get tickets at McCrum's up on Main Street. Um, but it's also a fundraiser for the cemetery and the Stonewall Jackson Memorial Hospital, which was opened that year by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. So, I mean, I don't know how much you know about the UDC, but it's the very conservative lost cause group that is doing crucial charitable work in town and creating a hospital, right? Um, it's a segregated hospital, uh, une unequal care, but the lines that we might assume aren't totally predictable here. I, I really want to I, I'm going to get a music student to like figure out how to perform and figure out what this opera is. Uh, if there are any music students here, I'd love to talk with you um, about that. Here's another performance at Washington and Lee. This is the centennial of McCormick's Reaper, which we now know was created both by um, McCormick and an enslaved worker of his named Joe. Um, and uh, interestingly, the Nightingales come and perform one of many episodes. They do a plantation episode, okay, with uh, children and clodhoppers, right? So here we're kind of getting the, you know, uh, think a little bit of Sambo Mammy kind of tradition, um, but tied into an important institution. This is 1931. This is when she's going to be doing a national fundraising campaign for the leading Republican Black congressman in the United States. And at the same time doing this, right? So people cross lots of different boundaries. This is a different poet who is influential to Walker, uh, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. And she creates this persona called Aunt Chloe. Chloe, among other things, is a character in Uncle Tom's Cabin, kind of a mammy figure there. But uh, Harper really redefines her. She makes her a, a reconstruction character who lives through the war and is a very shrewd woman, sometimes calls herself radical um, woman, who sees uh, new possibilities, advocate for Lincoln, um, critic of the Ku Klux Klan, right? Um, and clearly, Eliza Walker has read these poems and takes them in new directions. And there's work to be done here. I'm, I'm trying to sort this out. Um, but I didn't know about this Aunt Chloe for a while. I'd known about the Uncle Tom. Um, and if you see down here, this is about selling voting rights. Um, ugly tricks. I mean, does this sound familiar in 2020? Do we trust elections? Is, it, is there fraud? Who do we trust? I go for voting clean. Um, and we're going to get into questions about Republican politics. Do the Republicans represent Black people in the way that they used to? Um, what do we want to stand for? Here are some links you can go back to um, and, and find. It's a really interesting dissertation about vernacular and classical poetic traditions. So this isn't just someone growing up within kind of limited education. You know, she's studying Latin models. Um, this is, um, again, lots of small print. Uh, Harper's poem, it's called The Deliverance. So 
the character is actually a white woman slaveholder, uh, um, mistress, mistress, who watches her own son go off to war, okay, and, and sort of worries at that. Uh, the war ends, everybody celebrates. When the world ran through the village, the colored folks are free. We held a jubilee, Juneteenth. When they told us Mr. Lincoln said slavery was dead, everybody loves Lincoln. Chains were broken too. We didn't know what to do. Um, Lincoln was shot by a wicked creature. Um, what happened next? Then we had another president. What do you call his name? I love that. <laughs> I'm not even going to dignify with President Andrew Johnson with his name. Uh, we thought he'd be the Moses, like her poems, but they weren't. But now we have a president. Who's president in 1872? Grant. Grant kind of gets a, a bad rap today, I think, in a lot of circles. Grant was a hero. Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass came to have more good things to say about Grant than Lincoln in many instances. Because what did Grant do? He presided over getting black men the vote. Lincoln did not get men the vote. Douglass had an important relationship with Lincoln. It's really important to understand. What else did Grant do? He passed the first Civil Rights Act of 1875. Okay, that tried to put the Klan away, but we'll see, didn't work. Okay, and then down at the end, um, I can't find it on my screen. Uh, had not we women radicals just got right in the way? Right? So Watkins sees, I'm, I'm sorry, Harper sees herself as a woman radical. I do not think Eliza Walker would characterize herself as that. Not as, and by that, that means also radical Republican reconstruction. But Walker is not like a, a socialist radical. Few were in this period. But, um, but Walker sees something. Um, this is Oscar de Priest. I just quickly want you to know he's the first black congressman elected in the United States outside the South, that feels weird. But for a few years, we have Southern black Republicans elected by reconstruction legislatures. But it's not until 1928 that Oscar de Priest is elected in Chicago. This is great migration. Um, and um, he will become the cause like today in my, I won't tell you how I vote, you can probably figure some of these things out. But I got so many um, voting solicitations this year by out-of-state campaigns, right? They, they know what my party is, and they want me to send money out of state. Eliza Walker is helping the Chicago machine get the priest into Congress because they see that helping Black people does that help a Republican cause? It's a little trickier. Okay. De Priest is important. When she hosts the state convention of the Virginia Federation of Colored Women at her house, this is Blandome, okay? This is my house. <laughs> I'm bringing the state to me. It is the first convention after the passage of the 19th Amendment. Can you imagine all these women with their badges? This is the first year that in principle, in principle, we will be able to vote. Many of these women did cast ballots, many of them did it. Okay, black women's suffrage, certainly through John Lewis, the 1965 Voting Rights Act um, was highly limited um, and obviously beyond, but she hosts this. I mean, this is a big, big deal. Right, and several of the women you were talking about are in here. Walker's in here. Uh, Nanny Woods is in here. Um, the president of the state is in here. These are power brokers. Here's Aunt Chloe. Um, so Mrs. Eliza Walker, um, it's interesting to me, she uses her first name here. Um, she's not selling this at the sanitary meat market. I'm Mrs. Eliza Walker. 
And I'm not going to have time to, to really dig deep into the politics. Uh, I think Professor Golubos put on your plate a really, really interesting question. Why is a woman who comes out of a Black Republican tradition suddenly with her husband hosting meetings of colored Democrats at their house? And, and you have to recognize it's sort of flipped from what we think today. Democrats are the conservative party in the South in the 1930s, really, until Roosevelt will kind of help shift that a bit in the civil rights movement. So Republicans were the party of Lincoln, Grant, and Teddy Roosevelt, all right? Quote, unquote, the black man's friend. But things are starting to shift. And she's using this dialect. This is not the very nice religious dialect we know she's capable of, right? We know it's not like she's, this is just how she talks, right? No, like she's capable of doing this. She's mimicking other dialect traditions. It's a satirical voice. Right. Um, and the satire is, I don't, it's not against a priest. I don't think it's actually against Republicans here. I think it's, it's, why are all these people bandwagoning who aren't good candidates? I, I think she sees that there's kind of a watering down of choices and it, it's going to play into the hands of a certain establishment. And if that happens, who are our friends? Can we find allies in the Democratic Party? I don't know. That, that's kind of where I'm thinking. Some of you may be politics majors or good in history. I'd love some insights. There is, there is a national story here. There's a website I could show you that tracks in Virginia the black vote. In Rockbridge County, I did find this, goes from 1924, the Republican vote, not quite something like 34% to 38% in 1928, and then back to like 34. Or, or um, the other way around. <laughs> the other way around. That, um, no, 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 that's right. There, there's, it, it goes up um, in the Herbert Hoover election, right? Hoover wins in 1928. That doesn't turn out well for the Republicans or for America. And in 32, Roosevelt becomes the voice of the Democrats. And you'll see there's a lot of, um, she's got a lot of time for Roosevelt. I'm going to need to move quickly here. I just want you to see that this is her manuscript. I would say this is what we call a fair copy. That this We're going to see drafts, but this is a pretty clean copy. There are even some manuscripts we have in the files. I think her daughter transcribed or cleaned up. It's a slightly different handwriting. But we know, again, she published this in a newspaper, political advocacy. Um, this continues. I just want you to see we get two verses here. This is a this is an eight-verse poem. Um, and it gets complicated politically. And, you know, we've got a character named Roscoe, um, you know, there's, there's stuff about Virginia folks get so scared, right? So we're looking, this is the woman who holds a state conference, right? She's looking at Lexington, Virginia, and the nation. Um, and Heflin, Senator Heflin in Illinois, I mean, she's breaking down why, how, how is the Illinois Senate race versus the Chicago you know, Congress race breaking. And why is she buying into this? You know, she, you know, has this big take on publicans and the dead publicans are Lincoln, Grant, and Roosevelt. She's quite specific that there are 15,000 Black Virginia voters at the ready to do something. Like, where do you think, I mean, she can't, make them all do it. She's not the, a machine, but she knows there's a Democrat machine down at the bottom, right? And when the Democrat machine goes away, what's going to be left? If we can mobilize 15,000 voters, we can change the elections. And we know that happened. When the 1902 Virginia Convention disenfranchised Black male voters, the state politics changed utterly. 
when you brought them in in 1867, suddenly you could pass civil rights acts, okay, until you wrote them away. So I just, I had read this before. I had not seen the 15,000. And I, 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 it's just, God, she's doing her homework. 15,000 voters, All right? She's an organizer. So here is that meeting at the house. Here's the Oscar de Priest, but she's not just doing mail order. She brings him to First Baptist Church in 1931, right? She says, my state club, my name, my church, he will be here in person. Um, and we're going to bring, we invite our white friends as well. I don't know who they are, how that plays out. But, I mean, look how she's playing the world. She's a moderate figure of a certain sort. And ultimately, if you had to, to say, I, I'd put her in a certain kind of moderate camp. Um, won't have time to do this. This is a poem. It's called I'm a Gold Star Mother. It's about a woman who lost her son. Gold Star Mother is a World War I phenomenon. Okay, uh, 1918. This is, she's writing this shortly after she has lost her own son to pneumonia, not to war. Uh, and it's a long poem. I, I heard them come and knock on the door to draft my son. It's like the Grim Reapers knocking on her door. And, and there's an Aunt Chloe poem that does this in effect, except it's the white mistress <laughs> that, that came to knock on my door to take my son away and die in the war. And what happened next, and a fascinating end of this is the narrator, the woman narrator says, I'm watching my son go off to his death in World War I. I'm remembering that my father, who was a slave and a soldier, died. So my, my black father was a slave and could only have become a U.S. colored troop soldier and died. And here I am now as a mother sending my son off to national service and I'm elevated as a gold star mother. So I'm working on transcriptions and interpretation of this poem. Um, and then down at the bottom, she's like plotting out, what are we gonna sing at the concert tonight? <laughs> and then she's got like this script upside down for how are we gonna teach children clean living and truthfulness? And this is her workroom. This is like my inbox, right? My Google notes. She's doing it all together. It's porous between poetry and speeches. Um, the petitions you're gonna read for Thursday about the unemployment commission. This is like a goofy little poem telling you to buy cookies with jelly in them. Jam jams. I don't know if you know what jam jams are, but they're like circle cookies with little jam in them. So like they sell them at the store, come buy them. And this is on her husband's stationery. She's drafting them out. Here, this is a much more complicated poem. Go, go shop local, buy at your local stores, right? Which makes sense for everyone, but also like if you're married to a shop owner. But what it really turns into is she shaking her finger at people who are leaning too hard on asking credit from the store owner and not repaying them. Now think about this. This is one of the wealthier families in Lexington, period. Not just black families, period. Right? And she's kind of, don't abuse your credit. Well, yeah, gotta make your business. But this is very clearly written. I mean, she's drafted this out before. And she's doing it in dialect, in your local stove, right? They ain't no count. So why would she choose that voice? And if you're poorly clad, hungry, white or black, I mean, this is back to the orphanage kinds of things. Um, so last bit, um, and we'll go. Here's another one she's drafting out. Now we're to Roosevelt. So we're after 1932. I don't have a, a, a document date. Roosevelt done just what he said. When we were hungry, he gave us bread. He grabbed his country in his fist and he turned it around without a mist. 
He started the wheels to ring fast and the people a new hold did grasp. So there's economic leadership, political leadership. And I would want you to think, I mean, Alex Wood, her grandson said, the depression hit black families and businesses, especially hard in 1930s. There are businesses. I'm, the walkers weathered things well better than many. Okay, but she's clearly thinking about these dimensions. And I don't know, if we find ledgers, I'm sure they're bottom line papered. Um, there's a whole thing about schools. I won't go into that, but this is the school she would have gone to. Um, see what school faculty were paid and weren't paid. Uh, well, Eric, we um, we talked a little bit about this. You read you read um, Ted Delaney's piece and actually showed him this this um, ledger. Um, good, excellent. Yeah, I mean it it tells the story. Um, here's the new school. It is the city school building today. It's the building I teach at. Um, she raises money for the school. She says, we black parents will pay for the faculty salary of what we would call 11th grade. She's not even asking the city to pay the taxes to do it, but we need their permission to let us hire a faculty. You're not even allowing our kids. We have to send our kids to Bluefield, West Virginia or Richmond to get high school degrees. But there she is, Mrs. H.L. Walken. This is Marilyn uh, Vice Mayor Alexander's grandfather, Sylvester Evans, right? Uh, these are descendant uh, figures. Um, this is Ted Delaney, right? In seventh grade um, as a class of 61 figure. And don't know if any of you had the good fortune to, to study with or be mentored by Professor Delaney. He was a mentor of mine. Um, and so he really is, I think, importantly, a Walker legacy of, of many others. So really fascinating woman, so much so I've been impinged on your, your other time. But I hope there are things to spool out there and that at the very least you can see how different areas of culture can come together to do civic and political work. And I, I think she's a, a good witness to that at a moment in time when women are, are starting to take the lead uh, for doing that. The end. Awesome, thanks Eric. That was, that was great. Those are um, just the last pictures of her. Thanks, and you said you're gonna, are you gonna send me that uh, PowerPoint so I can put it up? Yeah, I think 